morning, everyone. So uh, to piggyback off of what Eric mentioned about the serve cards before we get into today's uh, talk, I don't know what it is with these guys. Every, every service today, this thing gets farther away from there. So I don't know. It's hard to find good help. You figure that out? So anyhow, it's like, I don't know. Anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll record it. We'll see who's actually guilty. When I mentioned it before, everyone went like this. So I don't know. All right. So uh, in front of you, hopefully around you in a seat pocket, is a serve card. I mentioned this last week. Um, I know that school is out. The public schools are out. And so attendance is a little bit down from that. But we have, re- uh, have got a lot of new folks coming to church. And so we want to invite them to be a part of the service uh, and, and the serve team. And so if there's some areas on the back that you are interested in, um, please let us know. We'd be happy to help you out. Most of the areas of serving in our church is once a month. There are a few things that are more often than that, but primarily that's it. Um, I'm not, the, if you're new here, I'm not the kind of the pastor that complains every Sunday about how we need more and more and more. I don't, I don't do that, but when there is a, a need and when there are some areas that have holes in it, I want to point it out so that we can jump into that, all right? So do pray about that. And then last week I mentioned um, the handouts from last week, which is a beige piece of paper in the lobby on the way out. It says, My Identity in Christ. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and then also the gold sheet uh, about who I am in Christ as well. And so we ran out last week, so we made more of them. If you want them, you're certainly welcome to, to take them on the way out, and we'll talk about that, all right? So y'all ready? All right, you want the long version or the short version? Short, okay, that's right. Someone says 1.30 of the game's on. I don't know what game it is, but it doesn't matter. Is there a game at 1.20 or 125? Huh? The who? I, I thought high school teams played on Friday night. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So we're in part two of, of a wounded, in, actually part three, but part two of the thought process, all right? So the wounds that we're talking about in the series aren't wounds that you have stitches or something from an accident or something like that. We're talking about wounds that are inside of us. And the reality is the wounds on the inside of us are much more complicated and much more difficult to find healing in our life than the wounds on the outside. And so the series, week number one, two weeks ago, we talked about words, words words that we say to ourselves and words that others say to us, and how that gets us in a mindset which kind of leads into last week and this week, which is our thought process and how kind of astray we can go on our thought process. Now, I'm guessing that all of you just looking out here, you guys are by far the best looking 11 o'clock service I preached at today. Um, You guys have no struggles with your thoughts, right? In fact, What God is going to do is he's going to use it in your life to minister to somebody else, okay? Now look to the person on your left, because that might be the person, or the right, right? So all of us have thoughts that go into the ditch, and people will say, you know, they'll struggle with it, and they're believers, and they wrestle with, you know, how come I'm having these thoughts, and where are they coming from, and we just wrestle with it in our life, and so how do we overcome them, and how do we make the changes that God desires for us to have? So at the very top of your outline, and this is from last week as well, is you'll hear me say that it goes thoughts, feelings, actions, all right? So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Uh, The heart is the wellspring of your life. What's in you is what comes out of you. And so everything starts as a thought. And then it develops into an emotion or a feeling in our life. And then ultimately an action in our life. And so if you're wrestling with a, with a habit to overcome, most places will talk about the habit. About not the restaurant, but about stopping. You need to stop. You need to start. You need to you know, hide it, whatever. And they're talking about the, the issue. You got a drinking problem. We need to hide the booze. Well, actually, that's not the issue. The issue is your thoughts, because it's what your thoughts are that leads to feelings that ultimately reveal itself in an action, all right? And so for many people trying to break um, strongholds in their life is they got to figure out their thought process and the lie that they believe that's leading them to that action. 
And so the thought process that we have in our life is ginormous because it affects every area of our life. And so I used this illustration last week. All of us have two dogs, okay? And you may not have known you had a dog coming in today, but you have two dogs. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have two dogs. You have your old nature dog, yap, 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 and you got your new nature dog, and that is your spiritual dog, okay? Now, the dog that you feed is the dog that wins. So when we think about our thoughts, and you think about your thoughts, is it thoughts that are honoring to God? Do we have the mind of Christ, like Scripture says? Or are our thoughts not going in the direction of the Lord? Because that dog is the dog that you're feeding. All right, are you all with me? All right, so by default, every single one of you, and if you're a believer, it's true in our life as well, by default, your wiring, hardwiring system defaults back to your old nature dog. You ever have a phone or a computer and you go through all the tech support and they finally say, reset it back to factory settings? Our factory settings is our old nature. Okay, it's only by choice, and we'll talk about what that looks like in surrendering, that we feed the new nature dog. All right, are y'all with me? So chapter 7 of Romans deals with that. Chapter 8 is the answer to chapter 7. All right, so here we go. The very top of your outline, here's a verse that all of us know, and we are living it in our life, unfortunately. Here's what Paul says, Romans 7, verse 15, and again, this is from last week as well. Do, I, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. Is there a hearty amen to that? But what I hate, I do. Okay? That is one verse that most people as believers are knocking it out of the park. Okay? I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that that's a verse that we, we oftentimes live with. So then Paul comes around a few verses later, and he says this. So I find this law at work. <clears throat> when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Okay? That does not mean your spouse, and it doesn't even mean your ex. Okay? Are you with me? For, verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Stop there. In other words, I have a desire in my heart to want to come and serve the Lord. I have a desire in my heart to want to come to church and grow spiritually in my life and surrender. And I go, want to go to community group and I want to pray and I want to do all that stuff. Right? Again, vast majority of believers, that's exactly where we are. So for my uh, inner being, I'm, I delight in God's law. Verse 23. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law uh, of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So in other words, here is a picture of his two dogs, right? He's got his old nature dog, and that dog is yapping, and he's got his new nature dog. And he's have, he has this conflict that he's wrestling with in, uh, inside of him as he's wrestling back and forth. And so in chapter 7, he lays out seven different weapons of destruction. And they are primarily in our mind. And so again, we covered them last week. I'm just going to read through them quickly here. The first one is shame. And that is where we looked at no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you missed again last week, I think that was a good part. Uh, number two in your outline is we have under uncontrollable thoughts in our life. Uh, three is we have inner desires. You know, some would say habits. Some would say things that we're compelled to do. Uh, number four in your outline is fear. Uh, number uh, five in your outline is hopelessness. Number six in your outline is bitterness. And then number seven in your outline that he addresses from chapter seven is insecurity. So then Paul wraps up chapter 7, and here's what he says. What a wretched man, right, or modern translation, what a hot mess I am, okay? And then the bold word is what word? Who, okay? This is true in the life of believers. 
Oftentimes, when you look at those seven destruction, weapons of destruction, shame, insecurity, right, all those different ones, oftentimes people try to solve it with a what, not a who. And so when you think about insecurity, well, I feel insecure about myself, and so I need to go out and get a what? I need to get a better job, I need to get more pay, I need to get a degree, I need to get married, I need to get divorced, I need to get this, I need to buy a new outfit, and it's all what's. And you go through those lists, and you can think through them in your life or certainly other people's lives as well, and it's all about a what? I got uncontrollable thoughts. I got to do something that's going to calm me down. Well, what are you going to take? And it's a what. And Paul says the answer to that is a who. It is Jesus Christ living in you. Right? It is not a what. It is a who. So he says, who will rescue me from this body of, de- uh, of death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. Watch the two dogs here. But, uh, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. And yet he says, in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. And there's these two dogs that I'm feeding, right? And again, that is the, that is the thing that we wrestle with in our life. And so then chapter 8 begins to tell us the remedy to those areas of destruction. Now, last week, uh, number one in your outline, we're going to cover one and two real quickly, and then we're going to get into today. So the habits to change our thoughts, number one we looked at is that I must think daily on what Jesus did for me, and that's Romans 8, 1, where it says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And again, for those uh, folks who are walking around with condemnation, please go back and listen to the message I think it'll be worth it. It says that uh, Jesus' righteousness is imputed or placed in us, and as a result of that, the shame has been removed because of Christ, okay? And that is the things that we've done wrong and so forth. Number two in your outline from last week is I must ask the Holy Spirit to change my thoughts, and that's in in verse eight, or verse uh, five, rather. And and so that is uh, the idea of replacement. So what persists in your life, you cannot resist. So when you say, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you're going to lose. You want to, because that's part of the old dog, right? And so you have to replace it. And so there's a a changing of the channel, which we talked about last week, all right? So number three, so here we go. Number three in your outline, starting new, that I must realize that I have a new power to say no. Before I was a believer... And in the old nature, by default, I have nothing other than willpower. That is it. And in order for me to overcome my inner desires that I have, my habits, my urges, my lusts, the old nature stuff is simply willpower to overcome it. How's that working? Not very well right? So we get into that cycle of destruction, right? Good intentions, good intentions, maybe a minute of success, then failure, defeat, condemnation. I feel terrible. And then we go through that cycle and it's just round and round and round we go. So Galatians says in five, uh, chapter, uh, verse six, chapter 5, verse 16, here's what Paul says. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit. And this, that word live means to walk or to tread around. Uh, when we did the series on unseen worlds, the last three weeks is about the Holy Spirit. If you missed it, go back to the church's website. I talk about what it means to tread around or to walk in the Spirit um, in our life. And so he says, to live by or to tread around by the Spirit. And he goes on and he says, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, right? Now, it doesn't say that you will not have them. It does not say that you will not have the desires of your old nature. It doesn't say that you won't have temptation. So folks come to Christ, they have the same kind of baggage, and they're like, what happened? Well, it doesn't say that you're not going to have them. It says that you will not gratify them. For you now have the ability to say no to them. In your old nature, all you had was willpower. That was it. That was all. 
And maybe you did, maybe you didn't, whatever the case is, but it was gonna, gonna lo- uh, you were going to lose. So then people will say, as believers, well, Pastor Dan, I tried to make changes. I can't make the changes. This is just who God made me to be. Now, some people think, have you ever heard that, actually? And the answer to that is, far more than you or I want to admit it. As a believer, the old is gone and the new has come. You are a new creation in Christ. So even if it was your old nature, it doesn't mean that because something is natural that it's good, right? So people say, this is just how God has made me, so you have to accept me. Well, acceptance is a different issue, and that isn't even a part of the message, but just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's good. Now, we go to the the grocery store, and we look for the organic, right, and we pay more, and then I take it home and spray pesticide on my stuff so it lasts longer. Just kidding, all right? Some of you are like, really? Cyanide is natural. Care to have some? And the answer to that is, no one's lining up, right? Because no one wants that arsenic, rather, not cyanide. Arsenic is natural, right? No, No one wants that. So just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's right either because it could be naturally from the old nature. Are you all with me? So verse 9 goes on, and it says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, believers, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And if, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So, so Paul is simply making a fact here. He's saying, listen, if you are a believer, the Spirit of God dwells in you. How much of it? All of it. If you're not a believer, the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, okay? And and so it it isn't an issue of, do I have all the Holy Spirit in my life? The real issue, the question that we wrestle with is, does the Holy Spirit have all of me? Am I surrendering and submitting to Him fully and completely in in, in every area uh, of my life, right? And so that is really the struggle that we oftentimes have. Then verse 10 goes on, it says, But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Verse 11, And if the spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, Through his spirit, and the verse goes on, uh, who lives in you, verse 12, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it, right? So it's, it's not to that nature in which we are to live according. We have an obligation. So as a believer, and this might be tough for some, but as a believer, you cannot say, I can't stop. That is not true. That is a lie that you believe, but that is not true. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in you to overcome hurts and hang-ups and heartaches that you have in your life. And, And so that power is in you to do that, and so you might wrestle with it, but that is the reality. And so in your outline... Behind every self-defeating thought in my life is a lie that I believe, right? And, and that is true in the area of strongholds in our life. And again, people say the stronghold is the action. That is not the problem. If someone is an alcoholic, their drinking is not the stronghold. It is the lie that they believe that leads to that. And if you can figure out what the lie is that you believe about why you can't calm down, why you have to have a glass of wine to, get, to calm you down, if you can figure out what that lie is, you will be able to overcome the stronghold. Are you all with me? And so we have it in us, in our life. And again, that goes back to the thoughts, feelings, and actions, obviously, in our life. So, the, so number three is that we realize that we have a new power in our life 
to say no, and that is to, affect, uh, that is to, to cancel out the inner desires that we have in our life. Number four in your outline is I must turn my thoughts toward God whenever I am afraid. I must turn my thoughts toward God whenever I am afraid. And so in verse 14, he goes on and he says, but those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Stop right there in the comma. You know what it's implying? That before you were a believer, you had a spirit of fear. Now, it comes from one of two places. It comes from the old nature or the enemy. And we'll see this in a moment, right? So in our old nature, we have a spirit of fear in our life. And when you have that fear in your life, if that is the dog that you're feeding, that fear will continue to grow. Right, and, and this is the thing about anxiety and stuff that if the sooner you cut that off and recognize what's leading you, the, the better off you're going to be because fear has a way of feeding in our life, right? And it grows and it grows and it grows. And the amazing thing about fear is it is a great predictor of things that will probably never happen, right? And so he says, you do not have that in, uh, in your life, um, for you do not, uh, for you do not receive the spirit uh, that makes you a slave to fear, but you receive the spirit of what? Sonship. All right. And if you'd like to doodle on your stuff, so this is this is the antidote to fear, right? The fear is is that we're not recognizing who we are, right? That we have the spirit of sonship. And as a result of that, what do we cry out? Abba, Father, which means Daddy, Papa, right? The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit uh, that we are God's children, all right? And, And so this becomes an important part of recognizing of how to overcome fear when it runs in our life. And you can jot this down. I didn't have time to put it in an outline because I kind of switched things up. But the first thing is, is that you recognize whose family that you're in. And he says, you have the spirit of sonship. You are a daughter. You are a son of the living God. All right? And so that becomes an important part. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever experienced a privilege or a blessing based on the family that you are in? I did. All the way back in 1984. President Reagan, remember him? He was president, and there was a hiring freeze on all governmental positions. All right? And so I graduated in 83. I wasn't going to go to college. My dad says, I'm going to get you a job at the shipyard at Mare Island. He worked at the shipyard out there. And he says, I'm going to get you a job. It's a hiring freeze, except if you're related to Bill Buchert. Then I got a job, right? So the president says a hiring freeze, but because of who I was related to, I was hired right? And it was funny, as a side note, I remember going in, I'm like 19, right? I didn't know what, where the direction was to get into the building kind of thing, right? I'm a, just a moron. So I go in, this guy gets in, he starts like interrogating me on how can you get hired? The government has a freeze and all this other stuff. And he went on and on and on for about 25 minutes. So I, I finally left and I walked and called my dad and I said, hey, this guy, I don't know what's going on. So my dad sent like five guys in a golf cart with different colors. If you know anything about the government, the color of your helmet is a big deal. And they weren't the guys that normally cruised about. And so I had like five guys. So for the, the two and a half years that I worked at the shipyard, they actually thought that I was related to the military commander of Mare Island. I wasn't. But my dad, I told my dad, I said, they all think that I'm related to so-and-so. And he goes, don't tell them otherwise. So for the longest time, they thought that. They would even ask me, like, they're like, have you ever been into his, in his house? And I'm like, yeah, and actually I had. And I said, yeah, you walk in, there's a library to the side, you go down there, there's a kitchen, and I, you know, I described the house, they're like, you are related to him. And I'm like, I just smiled. I didn't, I wasn't a believer, so what difference did it make, right? <laughs> Plus, it's the government, right? So I learned a couple things. One, if the president says something, means nothing, right? But I did experience the privilege of that. Now, just pause for a moment. I am the son of Bill Buchert. But even greater than that, I am the son of the living God. Right? 
And you are as a believer as well, the son or the daughter of the living God. Not the shipyard, but the one who spoke the world into, the, into an existence, right? And when we begin to recognize that, all of a sudden fear begins to shrink, right? Because what is greater than the Lord? The answer is nothing. And so it depends on what our vision is on. If our vision is on the fear issue, then it's going to overwhelm us. It's going to eat our lunch. But if it's on who God is, it changes everything. So I threw in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Not going to read it all, but it basically says God spoke the world into existence, and with a single word, Jesus holds everything in, in, in control. Right? With a word. And that person has reached down from heaven in his grace and his mercy and asked you to be a part of his family. Not the Buchert family, God's family. Right? And I think when we begin to kind of recognize that and internalize it, I think it radically changes. Then Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he says, For God did not give us, and so right above that I wrote, then who did? So God did not give us the spirit of timidity or fear. Who did? Your old nature and the enemy. Right? But he says, but God gave us a spirit of power, love, and of self-discipline. Right? So that is the spirit that God gives us. And so you can jot this down. When I am mastered by the master, I can master anything. And that's Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The condition is, he's the master of your life. So I, when I am mastered by the master, I can do all things. Right? I can master anything because of who he is. Amen? So verse 18 goes on or 17 rather, goes on, and it says, now we um, are children then, we are heirs and uh, heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we might also share in his glory. Number five in your outline, the fifth one that we overcome hopelessness is that we remind ourselves that God is good and that God is in control. And you can put a little asterisk by this one because this is the one that folks struggle with the most. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? And that is a struggle that everyone wrestles with. And at times, even in my own life, in services and funerals and stuff that I've done, trust me, there's been some time in my office where I'm like, God, this isn't fair, okay? But nowhere in the Bible does it say we live in a fair world, Right? And this is the part that we wrestle with. And so in, in, um, in our struggles with it in verses in chapter uh, 8, verses 9 through 15, or 25, which I don't have time to cover, it basically says this, that the world is broken, that relationships are broken, this world is in pain, this world is suffering. In fact, you can jot down verse 20 because it says everything is subject to frustration, Right? And I think that is so true. So life is hard. The environment groans. We have earthquakes. We have hurricanes. We have famines. We have wacky weather. And that is because in chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis, God's perfect plan was in chapter 3, sin entered the world. And because of that, we live in a broken world. So the earth cries out. The scripture says that we groan in pain because of broken relationships, because we are broken, and even the Holy Spirit groans on the brokenness of this world. And so because of that, we have bitterness that creeps in, and we have a time where we lose hope, all right? And so Paul addresses the, that in the next following verses. And so in your outline, pain in life is not optional. It's not an option because we live in a broken world. But misery is an option. And those are two separate things. So we're going to have brokenness. We're going to have illnesses. We're going to have death. We're going to have all that stuff. That is not optional. But misery about life is optional. And so Paul lays it out. And so here's what he says. And there's a few things that you might jot down if you're ready to write down some stuff. So verse 26 in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Verse 27, and he um, 
who searches our hearts knows the, mi- uh, the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And, and so this is always, to me, even when I read it a thousand times, it still amazes me. It's great that we have prayer teams. It's great that you guys pray for one another. It's great that you pray for me. But do you recognize that God is talking to himself about you? He is praying to himself about your life, about the situations that, you, that you're going through in life. And, and so the thing you can jot down as one of the things of the four in this verse, uh, these verses is that God's praying for you in your life. So regardless of what you go through, good, bad, or indifferent, he is, he is praying for you. Verse 28 goes on and it says, and we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him and been called according to his purpose. Now come back and underline a couple things. He says that God works, so circle the, the two words God works, and then underline called according to his purpose. Because this is an aha moment for many folks. And, and you can just jot down the note that God's promise is all things work together for good. Okay, now pause. Are all things good? No. There's a gazillion things that aren't good. But that isn't the promise that we will not experience them. The promise is that God is going to take our experiences and turn them good. Okay, and here is how it works. And if I could ever just do a book on this, I would. And that is when we begin to use it for his purpose, good comes out of it. Are you tracking? Because it says for those who love him and been called according to his purpose. All of us are to be the salt and light in a world that desperately needs hope. And when we take our tragedies and we turn them as part of our story for his glory, it becomes part of his purpose. So a couple things. When I begin to share my struggles and my heartaches, it is a sign that God is healing me in my life. When I am quiet about them for fear, for whatever reason, I am not, God is not healing me because he is not using it for his purpose. Are you tracking? Right? So you have to use it for his purpose, and that is to share your story, good, bad, and indifferent, for him to be honored and glorified. So here's the question. Pastor Dan, this has happened to me, and I know that I need to forgive them, The Bible says instantly I'm to forgive him, but it's a work in progress. How do I share that story? Because it sounds like I'm still struggling. And so as a result, the person doesn't say anything. But haven't you found that when you hear a struggle from another person, that it is encouraging to you because what you learn is you're not the only one right? That there are other people. And so a way of saying it is, and you don't even have to say names of people or whoever it is, give social securities and addresses. You don't need to do any of that. All you need to say is, hey, I've gone through a horrific thing in my life, and God is working on me to learn how to forgive. I know I'm commanded to forgive instantly, but I'm still a work in progress. And many times, that's just what a person needs because the struggle is, I feel like I'm struggling on an island all by myself. And so all of a sudden, God is going to use that to encourage them for for them to go, okay, so I'm not alone. A lot of folks struggle with the idea of forgiveness. Yes, we are to forgive instantly, but folks, the vast majority of folks, it is a journey to learn to forgive someone. Okay, and so we're, we're using it ultimately for his glory. And so you can jot down on the side, God is going to use all things for his good. All right, and then the verse goes on in uh, verse 31, and it says, then what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer to that church is no one, right? There's nothing that we can come up against that is above God. Illnesses, economy, Political parties, world issues, whatever, nothing is above the power of God in life. God is not tripping in heaven going, oh no, what am I going to do? 
right? I mean, he is perfectly fine with all the things that are taking place. And so the verse goes on and it says, then what shall we say if God is for us, who's, who can be against us? And that God desires for us to succeed. So he's praying for us. All things work together for good. He desires for us to succeed. And then verse 32 goes on and it says, and, uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us, and then what's the word? All things. Not just salvation. Not that you're going to go to heaven when you take your last breath here on this earth, but he is going to give us all things. He is going to meet every single need that we have. And so here's Paul's point. Humanity's biggest problem was there is a holy God and a sinful person. You can't work, you can't keep the law, you can't do enough to get to a holy God. And God sent his son to bridge the gap. Your biggest problem is sin. God met that problem in your life. Now, what are the other issues that you're wrestling with? Job, finances, economy, political environments, blah, 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 whatever they are. Is God not above them? That, that's his point. If he'll take care of your biggest issue, will he not also take care of the issues that you wrestle with just on a regular basis? And the answer to that, is, of course he will. Of course he'll intervene. And so we're reminded in moments of hopelessness that we're reminded that God is good and that God is ultimately in control. And then the last one in your outline, number six, deals with, uh, with insecurity. And it's this, I will remember that God will never stop loving me. People may walk out on your life. People may turn their back on you. People may say horrific things to you. But God will never walk away. We love, brutally honest, we love based on condition. You do, I'll love you. You don't, we got a problem. We'll look at this next week. Okay? God does not love us that way. So verse 38, here's what he says as he summarizes chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right? Just pause. I know you've been in church, you've heard that verse a thousand times. But are you living that verse? God in his grace has taken you and rescued your soul from the pits of hell. You had nothing to offer God. All you had was filthy rags. And he called your name and he placed you in his hand. And there is nothing that you can do that will cause him to love you more than he currently loves you. And there's nothing you can do that will cause him to stop loving you in your life. And when you can rest in whose family you're in and who has put his thumbprint on your life, it doesn't matter what the world says about you. It doesn't matter what your family says about you, what your ex says about you, what your coworkers, your neighbors. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what God says about you. And you can live your life secure. You may not be the most popular. Who cares? I play to an audience of one. That's it. That's all. And if God, if God gives me the thumbs up, I'm good. Right? And if he doesn't, I got some confession some repentance. And so when we begin to recognize who we are in Christ, then we can live the secure life that God has, has called us. Now the question is, is, well, Pastor Dan, are there a lot of people who have areas of insecurity? And the answer to that is absolutely. And you know where it manifests itself the most? Relationships. You know what kind of relationships? Marriage. People will do crazy things because of insecurity right? And so that's how that stuff manifests itself. And so we need to make sure that, hey, I am who God made me to be. I am who he says I am, and I am firmly in his hand. 
and nothing can shake that in my life. Amen? So the homework. So how are you going to feed your dogs? you got two dogs. you got your old nature dog and your new nature dog. And so here's some ideas. Obviously, prayer is important. I mentioned about the handouts. There's the gray sheet or the base sheet that, that says my identity in Christ and then the gold sheet, which is from previous for those of you who want it. Corporate worship and serving God. Those are important parts. But the dog that's winning in your mind is the dog that you are feeding. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together today. And Lord, I pray as we leave here today that we will just pause. Father, that we will take an evaluation of the thought process in our life. Lord, I pray that you will reveal to us which dog we are feeding. And if there's adjustments that need to be made, God, that you will begin to give us the guidance and direction to change what dog we are feeding. Lord, may we walk in victory today. May we be reminded of the power of Romans 8 and the important part of it in our life. Thank you for your love and your grace in our life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can grab the handouts on the way out. Also, Pastor Eric mentioned the uh, Halloween and then the cards. If you're interested in prayer, there is a room of prayer in room 201, which is across from the coffee. God bless you guys. See you next week. What an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week, and remember, God loves you.